Hello, my name is David Caperta, and this is the story of Route 66, a historic road in modern times. The Mother Road, Main Street of America, built to connect Chicago to the West Coast, allowing people to easily travel across this great land of ours. The logical way if you ever plan to motor west. A road from a different time, when things weren't so rushed, the destination was less important than the journey, and the cars couldn't go 70 miles per hour anyway. Then the interstates came along, allowing people to go directly from point A to point B as fast as possible. The towns along Route 66, now completely bypassed, drifted off into the sunset like the westbound travelers they used to have. And that's where the story usually ends, leading most people to think of Route 66 as a relic of a long-gone past, now just a dead road going through towns that are a shadow of their former glory. I wasn't so sure, so I decided to go on an adventure, experience Route 66 for myself, and answer the question, is the spirit of Route 66 as the Great American Road really gone? Most of the asphalt is still there, and you can still drive it, so when I had a little bit of time, I thought I'd check it out. Now, if I'm going to drive the Great American Road, I'm going to need a Great American car. And here it is. The 2002 Toyota Camry. This four-door mid-sized sedan comes equipped with a 2.4-liter inline-four engine that produces 157 horsepower, giving it a 0-60 to 60 time of about 10 seconds and a top speed that's purely academic. Now, I know what you're thinking about this great American car. Toyota? That's a Japanese car. Well, yes, Toyota is a Japanese brand, but this particular car was made in Kentucky, and the modern Camry has been ranked as the most American car, meaning there are more of them made in America by Americans with at least 75% American parts, which are presumably also made by Americans, than any other car built today. You may point out that that's not a modern Camry, and you'd be correct. That's because it's a very special Camry. It's mine. Okay, look, if I'm honest, I wanted to rent a Mustang, but that would have been expensive, and this way I can modify it to suit my own needs. So give the Camry a chance. It may not have the power of the Mustang, or the handling, or the excitement, or the appeal, but in the many years I've had it, it's always been my trusted companion, reliable as the day is long, never breaking down, and always doing what I asked of it. Any car will get you there, but the Camry will always get you home, and for that reason, I love this car. So, I had the car, I had the road, and I had the mission. So I grabbed my keys and headed off to the local library to do some research. I didn't have a lot of time to plan this trip, but I packed in as much as I could. I also didn't have a whole lot of time to take this trip, far less than I'd recommend, so you may notice some rough edges, apologies in advance. I also didn't have a camera crew, hence this format. All I had was myself and a camera. Hang on, that doesn't look professional enough. There we go. So now I had the car, I had the road, I had a modicum of research, I had a camera, and I had the mission. So I headed off to see for myself if the spirit of Route 66 was still there. And I started off, naturally, in Chicago. Home of the Ferris wheel, the zipper, the hot dog bun, the Chicago fire, both the event and the soccer team, and the Chicago marathon. The last one might seem obvious, but insufficient preparation meant that I didn't realize it was going to happen the same day I went there, shutting down streets and causing me to have to come back later to get the shots. It's also the home of the starting point of Route 66. Chicago is a fascinating city with a great history. Many people have said a great deal about it, so I won't. Frankly, I'm not that interested. It's a massive city with its own thing going on. It's a terminus of the route, a destination, not part of the journey. So I headed out. If I'm going to answer the question of whether or not Route 66 survived, I'm going to need to find some examples of the true Route 66 experience to see what happened to them. And I came across my first real data point in the town of Wilmington, Illinois, the Gemini Giant. Oh look, it got light out. Isn't continuity fun? Anyway, the Gemini Giant is a 30-foot tall fiberglass statue, one of the famous Muffler Man advertising props, that stands outside and promotes the launching pad drive-in restaurant. There's two aspects that I think qualify to speak to the Route 66 experience. The first is its use as a distinguishing feature. It's from an era where every restaurant across the route wanted to stand out rather than be part of a uniform chain, to give you a unique experience in order to draw you off the route and sell you something. The second aspect, sadly, is its status as a relic, as the restaurant it's intended to promote is no longer open. A counterexample of the Gemini Giant can be found just down the road in Pontiac, Illinois, in the form of the Old Log Cabin restaurant. It was originally built in 1926 to cater to the travelers of the route, However, in the 40s, the route was realigned to the other side of the building, meaning all those travelers would now run right past it. I feel I should explain something at this point. 
There's no such thing as a single unified Route 66. In fact, since the route was decommissioned as a U.S. highway in 1985, there is no such road as U.S. Route 66, just a series of individual stretches called Historic 66 or State Route 66 or something like that. But even before the decommissioning, there wasn't a single immutable stretch of tarmac from Chicago to L.A. called Route 66. The road was moved, what they called realigned, constantly to make the road better, say to cut a corner or go around a town to make it bigger. Sometimes it didn't even move all that far. On certain stretches, when they needed to expand, they'd build a bigger road right next to the original and then connect it up. You can see some of these original roads with grass growing through them, not a hundred feet from where the road ended up. Anyway, back to the old log cabin restaurant. Back in the 40s, the road was realigned and ended up on the other side of the building. The owners had to do something to stop the travelers from driving right past the back. So they did what anyone would do. They jacked the building up, rotated it around with horses, and plopped it back down so the front door was facing the road again. Thanks to that adaptability, the old log cabin is still open to this day. So we've seen part of historic Route 66 that has stood up to the test of time, and part that hasn't. But two points do not a complete data set make, and we can't draw any conclusions about whether Route 66 is still great without understanding the factors that made it great in the first place. The first factor, most obviously, is the history it represents. Speaking of history, let me give you a few dates. Early 20th century. There isn't really a road network to speak of. Between towns, there are dirt roads and the odd paved road owned by a private organization, or maybe even no road at all. Any cross-country journey by car takes months of blazing their own trails and is only attempted by the most foolhardy adventurer. 1916. The United States Congress realizes this and proposes legislation to federalize highways. They get around to passing it nine years later. 1926. Route 66 gets named as the Chicago to Los Angeles route and they start building it, finishing in 1938, making it the first fully paved U.S. highway in America. The towns along it flourish with the influx of motorists and their money, and everything's going just swell until... 1956. President Eisenhower, seeing the efficiency of the German Autobahn, is convinced that a high-speed road network is essential for national defense, and so signs legislation to establish the interstate highway system. These interstates route traffic away from the towns, and over the next decades, the communities that were previously booming become bust, until eventually, in 1985, the route was officially decommissioned as a U.S. highway. I want to make it clear that I'm not against interstates. I use them a lot. When I need to get cross-country quickly with the minimum of muss and fuss, they're a great solution. But I got a chance to drive a stretch of the route that runs alongside the interstate and draw some comparisons. It is certainly slower on the straights, and it has curves and stop signs, but it's far more fun, largely because it has curves and stop signs. It's not a monotonous cruise at a constant speed for hours and hours. You actually have to drive it. And even in my Camry, which, as I mentioned before, is far from the most sporty vehicle, I was loving the experience of driving, and you really start to feel the sheer freedom of driving. The other great thing about avoiding the interstates is you can pull over any time you want when something grabs your curiosity. Which segues neatly into the second factor of what made Route 66 so special. Weird attractions. See, if you can pull over any time you want, local businesses are prone to make you want to pull over. And the way they did this was by building landmarks that are just, mm, unusual. Something you can't help but stop and get a closer look at. The Gemini Giant, which I mentioned earlier, certainly fits into this category. Totem Park. An artist by the name of Vet Galloway spent his life building fiddles, his own lawnmower, and a 90-foot-tall concrete totem pole. The Catoosa Whale. A giant walk through fabric glass whale that Hugh Davis built as a surprise anniversary present to his wife. The so-called world's largest rocking chair, which is of course the second largest rocking chair in the world. It did at one point rock, but is now welded down for safety. The giant neon soda bottle outside of Pop's restaurant to advertise the fact that they have a lot of soda. The leaning water tower, which I'm assured was built like that on purpose. And the first weird attraction I came across, Henry's Rabbit Ranch in Staunton, Illinois, a collection of rabbits, both Volkswagen and the hoppy kind, among a bewildering array of junk that has been fashioned into sculpture. I asked Mr. Henry, why rabbits? His response was, why not rabbits? Can't argue with that logic. Just down the road from Henry's Rabbit Ranch is an example of the third factor that made Route 66 so special, a factor that should not be underestimated. Sheer dumb luck. To find out more about that, I headed to another Route 66 landmark that's still around despite people's best efforts. The Chain of Rocks Bridge, which spans the mighty Mississippi River between Illinois and Missouri, one of the major bridges along Route 66. 
Once it was supplanted in the 1970s by the Interstate 270 bridge about 2,000 feet upstream, it was scheduled to be destroyed. Uh, Steve viewers may notice that it's still there. That's because just before it was scheduled for demolition, the bottom fell out of the scrap metal market and it was cheaper to just leave it there. Thanks to that extremely lucky timing, the historic bridge is still used as a footbridge to this day, completely close to any motorized traffic. Except for them. Presumably they had a permit. That bridge, or indeed the I-270 bridge, which I ended up taking, leads to the gateway to the west, St. Louis. And what better way to commemorate the gateway than with the gateway arch? Also known as the St. Louis arch, for obvious reasons, it's a 630-foot tall arch covered in stainless steel, making it the tallest man-made monument in the Western Hemisphere, and also very, very shiny. And right at the top, I'm not so sure if you can see the windows there, you can actually take an elevator to the top and look out over the city. I thought that'd be a great shot, so I got in line for tickets, and if you remember how much prep I did before I left, you can probably guess how that went. Right, tried to go up in the arch. They're sold out for the day. So I licked my wounds and headed west a little more to find an example of another factor that led to Route 66's popularity. Legendarily, good food. In this case, the world-famous Ted Drew's frozen custard stand, where the custard is so thick, you can do this. While we're on the subject of legendary food, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one landmark I visited in Springfield, Illinois. The Cozy Dog drive through Not just an important piece of Route 66 history, but of American history. For you see, on this hallowed ground, the corn dog was invented. Now that I had passed through the Gateway Arch, not literally, of course, the road goes around it, I was on my way west, to a symbol of another factor that led to the route's popularity. Good old-fashioned American promotion. Merrimack Caverns is, literally, a hole in the ground. Admittedly, it is a very pretty one, but that doesn't really explain the tens of thousands of visitors it gets every year. For that, we have to talk about one particular proprietor of the caverns, Lester B. Dill. Dill recognized the profits to be made by having visitors tour his cave, so he did everything in his power to promote it. He hyped up its mythology as a hideout for Jesse James and a stop on the Underground Railroad. He blanketed the highways and billboards and painted the sides of barns so he couldn't pass through the area without knowing about it. He even had his son-in-law dress up as a caveman and go to the Empire State Building to promote the caverns. He's also responsible for a major advancement in the art of promotion. He invented the bumper sticker. Of course, promotion didn't stop at individual attractions, but extended to the route as a whole. Consider Andy Payne. In 1928, in order to promote Route 66, an event called the Trans-American Foot Race was organized, where people would run from New York to Los Angeles, mostly along Route 66. Also called the Bunyan Derby, it took 84 days to travel some 3,400 miles. 199 men entered, 55 finished, and Andy Payne won. The race was covered in newspapers nationwide, embedding Route 66 in the public consciousness. Even the name Route 66 was chosen for its promotional purposes. No, really. The story goes that the original proposal was to call it Route 60, because it's a nice round even number that's easy to remember. But another group wanted that number for the Virginia Beach to LA route. They got the name, and the Chicago to LA route was relegated to Route 62. 62 is harder to promote, so instead they chose to call it 66, thinking that having the same number twice would be more pleasing. And you have to admit, have a hullabaloo on Route 62 just doesn't have the same ring to it. Anyway, just down the road from Merrimack Caverns is my favorite town along the route, Cuba, Missouri. It's my favorite because it's a microcosm of the route, containing examples of a lot of things that made Route 66 great, wrapped up in a charming little town. It has the history. It was named Cuba in solidarity with the island nation, which was experiencing Spanish oppression at the time. It has the promotion. It's advertised as Mural City, as there's murals painted on the sides of many buildings. It has the weird attractions. The world's largest rocking chair, which I mentioned earlier, is just a few minutes west of downtown. And it does have some pretty decent chow. For example, Shelley's Route 66 Cafe. You know the food's going to be good when the place is so unpretentious, the menu comes in an office supply binder, and the cups have sports mascots on them. I was sad to leave Cuba, but the road soldiers on. Coming out of Missouri, the road plunges into Kansas. And plunges right back out of Kansas. The road only runs 13 miles through Kansas. There's not a lot to say about it. Right after Kansas, the road goes through Oklahoma, not Arizona, and yes, it matters. Because there's not one unified Route 66 and they kept upgrading it ad hoc, there's a huge variation in the type of road depending on need and budget. Along the way, I saw highways with four lanes, two lanes, both fast, 
and slow, and occasionally, unfortunately, zero lanes. One type I was not expecting to see, however, was one lane. This stretch is called the sidewalk highway. Basically, they only had enough money to build half the amount of road they needed. So instead of going half the distance, they went the full length, but only half as wide. Presumably, when you come across someone coming the other way, you pull to the side and let them pass. Given that I'm standing in the middle of the road to take this picture, this isn't as much a concern nowadays. Taking the sidewalk highway to larger roads eventually leads you to a display of what is, in my opinion, the biggest factor in making Route 66 so remarkable. The people. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, there is a plaza memorializing one of those people. Cyrus Avery, widely considered to be the father of Route 66. Like most fathers, he was one of the major players in the conception of the road. He wasn't the first one to come up with the idea of a transcontinental road, but he was certainly one of the loudest. He's actually the one who came up with the idea of calling it Route 66. He constantly pushed at the federal level for the road to be built and get people on it once it was. He considered Tulsa home, and seeing the economic benefits that a major route would bring, pushed tirelessly to route the route through his city. And there are still people making it their life's work to make the route better. Just down the road a ways was one of the highlights of my trip, the studio of Jerry McClanahan. He's the author of this book. Not sure why I took a picture of it, I have it right here. It's considered to be one of the most authoritative guides to the route. I had it in my passenger seat the whole way. In it, he says that if you're ever in Chandler, Oklahoma, you should stop by and visit him. I thought I'd take him up on that. I drove past this place a couple of times, it's really hard to find, but I did eventually find it and got to meet the man himself. Apart from being a great map maker and guide, he's also a fantastically talented artist, painting scenes from the route. But it was his expertise I was interested in, to pick his brains about the route after decommissioning. How has it survived? Well, all right. Uh, the, the big impact the interstates had on 66 was they took all the traffic off the route. And during the 60s, about when that was happening, you had the Highway Beautification Act, which meant uh, no new billboards could be put up and many uh, original ones had to be taken down. So it was a double whammy that hurt so many businesses. Then when they decertified the route in 1985, the newspapers were full of eulogies. Route 66 was dead. But there were so many people along the road and along the world that uh, loved the road, refused to let it go. Ever since then, we've been rebuilding it as a historic Route 66. Uh, there are towns that really get the old road. Uh, Pontiac, Illinois, for instance. Its downtown is full of Route 66 attractions. There's uh, several museums. There's, there's all sorts of things that make it worth your while to get off the interstate. Little Atlanta, Illinois is much the same. Tucumcari, New Mexico is, is constantly working to improve their stretch and other towns are getting on board with that. There are people that are spending their money and their expertise and their lives restoring old places on Route 66. Uh, for instance, in Cuba, Missouri, the Wagon Wheel Motel has been lovingly restored. The Boots Court in Carthage, Missouri is being fixed up beautifully. Just recently, uh, the Frontier Motel and Cafe in Truxton, Arizona was purchased by a uh, tour guide from uh, New Zealand and he's leased it to a couple who are fixing it up. It will be restored. It's great to see this resurgence in interest. It's great to see all the travelers from all over the world. That's probably the biggest group of Route 66 travelers, those from overseas and over the border. Uh, they're keeping it alive every time they stop at an old motel or stop at a museum or go through a town and buy food or gas and buy souvenirs. They're helping to increase the local economy and it's booming. I certainly met several international travelers along the way. Even though I wasn't traveling in peak vacation season, I still met people from all over the world at every stop. These people had heard the legends of the route and had wanted to experience it for themselves, spending their hard-earned money all along the way. Anyway, after my visit with Jerry, I hit the road again and plunged <laughs> deep in the heart of Texas. The first thing that struck me was the truth in that old adage, everything's bigger in Texas. From the rest areas, to the crosses outside churches, to the sky. There's also big fields, and in one of those is a big attraction. Cadillac Ranch. Before it was a Bruce Springsteen song, it was an art installation comprising ten Cadillacs half buried in the ground at an angle corresponding to the Great Pyramid of Giza. And part of the ongoing art of it all is you're encouraged to bring spray paint and leave your mark on the cars, a tangible manifestation of the travelers of the road contributing to making the road what it is. I saw a chunk broken off which revealed the strata of the spray paint. 
the Travelers were truly making their mark thousands of times. And it doesn't appear to be slowing down. There were about a dozen people there at the same time I was. And that neatly takes us to the midpoint of the route, I mean, not this presentation. By this point, I was significantly behind schedule, so you notice things will speed up from here. But this cafe marks the halfway point of the route. I know it's impossible to find the true midpoint of the road because the road keeps changing length when it realigns, but this is the place closest to the middle with the best pie, so I'm counting it. Plus, it gave me an opportunity to do what the old song said. I got my kicks on Route 66. Anyway, like I said, I was past the halfway point on time, so I had to hit the road hard. Driving west out of the panhandle of Texas, you get your first really good view of the American West. And what a view it is. I found it to be literally jaw-dropping in that, when I first saw it, I was uncontrollably agape. The geologic grandeur, the remarkable colors, but mostly just the vastness of it all. Things may be bigger in Texas, but they seem to be bigger-er out here. So big at one point, I saw a sign that proudly announced that there was a fast food joint only an hour away. While I was talking to Jerry earlier, he mentioned his disappointment that television programs seemed to skip over the western stretch of the route in favor of seeing the big sites like the Grand Canyon, Four Corners, or Monument Valley. And I completely understand where he's coming from. However, I couldn't cotton to the idea of coming all this way to say that I skipped the big sites, so I took some of my limited time left and decided to visit them. So Jerry, if you see this, I'm sorry. But if it makes you feel any better, I won't tell you about the Grand Canyon, Four Corners, or Monument Valley. Instead, we rejoin the route or more accurately, the interstate next to the route. Like I said, I'm not anti-interstate. Interstates have their uses, and making up lost time is one of them. And when I started Day 7 in Flagstaff, Arizona, I really had to make up some time. So I headed out west on I-40. But when I saw this pop up in my GPS, where I thought a stretch of Route 66 would be, I had no choice but to use some of my limited time and take the road less traveled by and find those beautiful sweeping curves. After all, part of the modern appeal of Route 66 is that it's a lot more fun to drive than a boring interstate. Though, as I've said before, my car might not be the most sporty, though, as I've said before, it is very, very reliable, it is still kind of fun to chuck it through the corners. So I got off the interstate and went looking for them. I knew something was wrong when that road on the GPS turned from a paved road into a gravel road, then a dirt road, then large puddles in the middle of a dirt road, and finally a dirt road with some men camping next to it. Not making that up. It clearly wasn't Route 66. I'll admit when I'm wrong, so I briefly gave up and turned around. On the way out to the main road, I came across a large puddle of unknown depth. I faced a choice. Either go through the puddle, potentially flooding the car, or go through the grass on the outside. I chose to go through the grass. Unfortunately, also in that grass, hiding, was this enormous rock, which the front of my car went over, and it being a front-wheel drive car with the front wheels off the ground, got stuck. One of the men that was camping next to the road was kind enough to tow me off the rock. But sadly, the rock had done its damage, banging an enormous hole in the exhaust, which made it sound like this. So I lent the car into a service station at the nearest town, Williams, Arizona, an absolutely lovely town that I absolutely did not enjoy because I was so worried about the car. It had done its job flawlessly. It was as reliable as the sky is big in Texas and I loved it for that. But I had done it wrong. I had gotten it into a bad situation and now it was damaged. I had to leave it at the service station and wait for them to open in the morning. I did not sleep well that night. I was worried about the fate of my trusty companion. Depending on how much damage the rock had done, it might have even been totaled. It's an old car, it's not worth that much. But there was nothing to do but sleep fitfully and go see it first thing in the morning. Sadly, Williams, Arizona isn't that big a town and the local shop couldn't do much. So I had to get it towed to Flagstaff. For those of you keeping track, Flagstaff is east of Williams, so I was technically making negative progress, which was certainly a bad thing given how little time I had left. I dropped my car off and got a loaner for the day. Luckily for me, it was another great all-American car. The Toyota Corolla. Now I know what you're thinking, Toyota, that's a Japanese brand, yada yada, this one's built in Alabama. There was nothing to do but spend another of very few days left puttering around Flagstaff. I got to see the Lowell Observatory where Pluto was discovered, so at least that was nice. But in the back of my head, all I could think about was my car. Would it get repaired in time? Would it get repaired at all? Would it, having gotten me most of the way along America's highway, Get me the final stretch to Santa Monica. Yes, it would. Thanks to the work of some really great men, it was patched up in less than a day, and I drove through the night, through the Mojave Desert, to Los Angeles, until finally I had reached the terminus. I had successfully driven the length of Route 66, all the way from Chicago to Santa Monica, some 2,451 miles. 
I had set off on an amazing journey and completed it. And I couldn't have done it without my Camry. While I may have ended up in it because I couldn't afford to rent a Mustang, I'm kind of glad because the Camry turned out to be the better metaphor. While some of the people who make it what it is may be foreign, at its heart it is all-American. And it may not be in its prime any longer, replaced by newer and faster things. And it's certainly taken its fair share of knocks. But thanks to the efforts of the people who love it, it still keeps going. That metaphor hints at the answer, if you couldn't guess it already, to the question I went on this adventure for. Is the spirit of Route 66 dead? Well, no. It's certainly not in its heyday anymore, as you would expect from the decommissioning, but all the factors that made it great, they're still there. It still has the weird attractions, it still has the promotion, the food, and the history. But most of all, it still has the people. People who love it, who make it their mission to rebuild and improve the route, to welcome all its travelers and make it a great experience. People like Jerry McClanahan, who spread their deep knowledge for all who seek it. People like Rich Henry, purveyor of Henry's Rabbit Ranch, for continuing to make the route an interesting place. And, of course, the tens of thousands of people, both foreign and domestic, who set out on the road every year to see what it has to offer. And if you still don't believe me, I'd like to turn your attention back to one of the attractions I mentioned very briefly. Pop's Restaurant in Arcadia, Oklahoma. It being a giant place with all the hallmarks of a great roadside stop, promotion, good food, and of course weird attractions, surely it's a relic from the glory days before decommissioning. So, when do you think it was built? 1960? 1970? Nope, 2007. But of course, the story doesn't end in Santa Monica. Because the Camry was my personal car, I had to drive Route 66 all the way back home. Which was fortunate, because Route 66 goes through Albuquerque, and it just so happened I'd be there at the same time as the Balloon Fiesta, the largest hot air ballooning event anywhere in the world. The balloons were spectacular enough, but, as it's been said before, it's better to end with a bang. I've been David Caperta, thank you very much for watching, and goodbye.